There we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. My name is Meredith Gershenson. And today, as the title suggests, we're going to be talking a little bit about how to track skills development for hourly staff. I am joined today by Michael Hillen. Michael, thank you so much for coming. Glad to be here with you, Meredith. Very exciting. Awesome. Michael is the principal at Drivetrain Learning. He has more than 25 years of business to business experience and leadership expertise to Eversana's learning and development team. His position focuses on training and competency consulting, specifically involving major account management and strategic account planning for healthcare and pharmaceutical clients. Michael also provides in-depth experience in case study and training simulation development with an emphasis on real world examples and scenarios for job experiences across the employee journey. Michael, I am so excited to have you on. Well, you know, you rattled off a whole bunch of things that I've done, but at the end of the day, it just means that I've uh, sat in different seats and accumulated a few experiences that hopefully will land well on some folks today. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. So for those who have not used our webinar platform in the past, I'm just going to give you all a quick run through. On the right, we have our chat box. Feel free to throw in any questions that you might have throughout. Um, we ha are going to have a Q&A with Michael at the very end, so be sure to throw in any questions you have. I will tag them and we will get to them. We also are going to have a couple poll questions, so those are just going to slide up right on the bottom left of your screen. Feel free to engage with those. We love to hear um, from your guys' perspective, where your head's at, etc. We are going to hand out a little article from Sherm on developing employees. It really sums up nicely on some of the high-level talking points and some of the data that we're actually going to be covering in our slides today as well. And finally, if you are a member of Sherm or HRCI and you're trying to get recertified, so if you're watching this live, I'm happy to offer those recertification credits at the very end. I will be sure to shout those out. And to give a little background on Workforce.com, we are HCM software that specializes for businesses with hourly staff. And we run this webinar series to present our learnings and data from our own clients. Awesome. So Michael, first and foremost, I would love for you to tell me about the experience that you do with Drivetrain specifically. So Drivetrain Learning is a boutique learning and development organization that we founded uh, back in 2015. Uh, it comes along after a, a career in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a short stint where I was in actually with a, a large commercial printer. Uh, very similar roles in terms of uh, managing complex clients or managing complex processes uh, with different team members involved. And so the, the organization that, we, that I head up now focuses primarily on engaging and developing sales representatives, people mm -hmm. on the front line engaging customers. Uh, but we also have supported call center employees uh, as well as other types of employees in organizations on the medical side. Uh, so think those that would uh, be engaged in medical studies and research uh, as opposed to those that are actually clinicians. Uh, so again, a cumulative effect of all those different roles that I've had over the years in engaging customers uh, and then teaching them how to how to learn and grow in their skill sets. Uh, that's what we do at, at Drivetrain through the, through a variety of different types of learning. So mm -hmm. not not only workshops that we deliver live, uh, either in person or remote, uh, but we have a like we have a library of over a hundred podcasts that I've recorded with guests or on my own that provide micro learning. So chances for people that we teach to learn on the go, where then where and when they want to learn and how they want to learn. So if they happen to learn better listening than Podcasts are a great format for that. Uh, yeah. We also offer white papers and other things that people can read. So we think of ways to teach people the concepts in different formats and at different points in time in their day. Sure. And education. I mean, that goes such a long way just for managers and making sure that their employees are well equipped. Absolutely. We, we actually heavily emphasize the role that the, the manager, the first line leader plays in that skill, not only the skill development initially, Oh. But even more importantly, the sustainment of it. So how do you keep that learning that you just invested in sure. embedded and alive with that person so you didn't just send them away for a workshop or have them read or listen to something uh, for a half an hour and then it just goes to waste? Right. Really emphasize the manager's role. Right. And how, helping to retain that information, I think, is so crucial. Absolutely. Uh, I would love, And you kind of touched on this a little bit already, but what has your experience been specifically within hourly workforce and upskilling frontline workers? So... I'll, I'll give an example. So, so the experience is all 
is very heavy actually in developing those frontline employees mm -hmm. uh, all the way from onboarding training uh, to ensure that they get the foundation of knowledge that's required to join the company. Uh, a lot of that's through partner parts of the organization, heavily with HR, but, but also other parts of the organization that are SMEs around different topics that are, are necessary. Uh, but also then through their, their ongoing development over the course of the first couple of years of their, in their role. Uh, so the experiences are, are pretty deep, uh, very differing from one organization to the next in terms of how it's done. Uh, but the key is to build those foundational levels of knowledge and not assume that that person already knows things that they may, you may think they know based on maybe how tenured they are, or even as simple as, um, they may have come from a similar organization prior to joining yours, so they might not already know it. I, I've always made the assumption that they don't. Uh, I really want everyone to be foundationalized in the set of learnings that we bring to bear. That way I know they're all gonna have the same foundation from which to build going forward. Uh, I think one of the best examples, uh, and I didn't run this organization by any stretch, but I had a chance to tour it, and that's a company by the name of Zappos. I'm sure many of you've heard mm -hmm. of it. Sure. Uh, it, it, they started out in shoes. <laughs> uh, they were absorbed by Amazon a number of years ago. And I had a chance to actually tour Zappos' facility out in uh, Henderson, Nevada, and, and see how they develop people. And it all had to do with how they grow the skills in their employees, because that was the marker for how the employees engaged customers mm -hmm. and how the customer retention rates with Zappos are so high. And so we can dive into that a little bit if there's interest to hear more there. But in terms of my own experiences, it really had to do with engaging that employee on those skills that are necessary for the job and ensuring they have ways to sustain it, as I mentioned, through micro learnings and, and letting them learn as they want to along the way. I love that. And it, it, I think what's great about drivetrain is it really emphasizes those smaller steps, those smaller learnings, as you have said, to make sure it has that bigger impact. I want to talk a little bit more before we even go into the learning aspect of it on some of the trends that you've noticed in skill development within these workforces. You know, how have these trends specifically changed um, with COVID and maybe even in terms of age cohort, we're talking people younger than 25, older and so forth. Well, I think we've, we've brought it up a couple of times already. Mm -hmm. um, that's the, the ability for people to learn how they want, when they want and in the manner in which they want. So it's kind of that Netflix model. I heard someone reference that. I'm not sure where it was, but I've heard it a number of times. So it's nothing I coined, but it's certainly something I endorse. And that's the ability to present a series of learning assets or a learning program that people can pick from based on the skill sets they need to develop, they wish to develop. That can align to a job description or mm -hmm. a competency model or, or a set of uh, just mutually agreed upon expectations when they join the organization or they start the job. This is what the expectations are. Mm. So aligning it to a formal document like a job description and or a competency model certainly helps the documentation of performance to or uh, lack thereof going forward uh, when you get into other types of conversations, retention or, or exit or promotion or, or reward. So to me, the ability to present different kinds of learning assets along that way and at different points in time with some, uh, I'll call it a milestone or a, not, I'm not going to call it a finish line because we're never done developing right. a milestone along the way that at the three month mark, a six month mark, a nine month, 12 month, things of that nature, you're expected to complete X number of these assets uh, and develop that skill and demonstrate that with your manager that you've begun achieving it or you need to work on it and they work with you to help develop it. So putting in, in, in front of them, the, the trends I'm seeing are, are the different ways to learn. Uh, there's way more coming out now on using AI uh, to assess people and to point them to competencies or skills that they're not quite achieving Interesting. Uh, and helping them then access certain assets that link up to that specific skill. So for example, in our organization, we've created an online diagnostic tool for salespeople to engage a fictitious account. Hmm. And they are presented with a variety of scenarios after doing a pretty substantial amount of pre-work that it kind of tests them or assesses them. And on the backside of each module, they get coaching from inside the system that says, hey, you did really well on these three things, but these two things over here, you didn't do so well. And here's what the skills are that are lacking. And here's a set of assets that we think you should go look at. And it's a 
combination of podcasts, white papers, smaller workshops, discussions with their manager, and it all goes to their manager as well. So there's a, a double-sided pathway to sustainment or reinforcement of those skills. So a couple trends I mentioned that that micro learning as, um, approach to uh, learning content, if you will, and then the AI approach to as well is something we're seeing a lot out there now. That's so interesting. I would love to point first and foremost to this first slide we got here. And I think this is a really interesting graph. We actually grabbed this from a white paper article from this year. Um, and, you know, they talk about why employees quit, of course, higher salary, better work life. That's something we've really been seeing since COVID. But these next two, desire to learn new skills and desire for more training, I think that is so interesting and honestly overlooked. And if you can get ahead of that, I think it would be interesting to see, you know, what the turnover rate, rate would look like for a company that uses resources, uses AI even, uses things like drivetrain. Michael, is this something that you're seeing, you know, with the company that you've worked with and their employees or frontline staff's needs? I think you, you mentioned it a minute ago, Meredith, and that in some of the trends uh, that you were highlighting related to ages in workforce. Mm -hmm. and, and what I find most interesting is that there's a significant amount of uptake of those that are more in my realm uh, of, on the age bracket. So in the 50 plus that are seeking learning and continuing to push the envelope on their own skill sets. I, I think it really boils down to the degree to which a person is curious. Uh, that's one of our hallmark words. Matter of fact, one of our core workshops is all about being curious. And, and we, the very first thing we do when we get people in a room or, or on a Zoom call uh, in, in breakout rooms is we ask this one question at the very beginning of this workshop, can curiosity be trained? And there's no right or wrong answer to that as people mm -hmm. find that there's an opinion and it's then supported by argument. That's all we want them to do is to have a dialogue with me or one of my facilitators about what your perspective is and why. Right. But that is an act, actually an innate trait that we find really shows the path toward those that want to continuously learn. Those that aren't thinking themselves to be, well, I've achieved all knowledge I need for my job sure. and I don't really want any more or need any more, so I don't need to be bothered by that. Now, there are people like that, but I honestly think the, the degree to which they're curious is much better marker than maybe an age bracket. I think what I'm also seeing is that uh, the, the micro learning format I mentioned before with the podcasts and white papers and little snippets, little mini videos. So think, you know, checking out uh, a, 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 a lot long story on Instagram with little bits and pieces of learning along the way has more traction with those that are younger than it would be with those that are older. The older mm -hmm. ones want to print out a big guide and read it and highlight it yeah. and talk about it. Whereas the youngers tend to think more in those little miniature moments of attention that they can, they can uh, uh, invest. But I think on the whole, there is a desire as curiosity uh, remains high in people where they want to continually grow. And I think that's where I'm seeing why employees quit is that uh -huh. I'm curious. I really want to grow deeper in what I'm doing or learn more about the organization, the business, the industry, and I'm either feeling hamstrung or I don't get any stickiness to my request. And so I'm just going to go somewhere else. Totally. And, and I think it all feeds into the aspect of not only wanting to retain those employees that want to learn because there's an aspect of hard work and dedication from those employees that they give and they give 110%. But it's also there's a sense of loyalty when you're offering these tools to train and to learn about the company. It really instills that value of loyalty from their frontline staff. And even when their staff typically on average, frontline workers are, I believe it's 16 to 24 years old, somewhere around there. And that's the majority of it. You know, those working as bussers, those working the cash register, whatever it might be. And I think it's really interesting, you know, to turn it and to really push that narrative on, okay, how can we train our staff to make sure that they're actually enjoying who they're working for, the main mission at hand, whatever it might be. I think you bring up a great point related to the, the retention and engagement and commitment, mm -hmm. if you will, on the behalf of that employee to that organization. And I'll, I'll speak back to, to Zappo. So I was sent out there to observe uh, and do their, uh, at the time they offered tours of, for other companies to come in and see how they do things oh. and, and learn what takeaways you could have. So the company I worked for at the time sent me out with 
leadership from one business unit to do the tour and to listen to their experience with it. And these were all first, second, third line leaders that all went to see, okay, how do they do this here? How do they engage their customers so relentlessly? What's the secret sauce to that? And so I went to observe and then I actually uh, assisted my business units first, second, third line leaders in the same tour. And I held a workshop on the backside to, to brainstorm, how can we take learnings from this and overlay that to how we do things in our organization? And that was a top 50 pharmaceutical manufacturer in the world, right. a very different industry than shoes. And so people were really struggling. How do we take these correlate or how do we correlate something here? Well, the key was how Zappos engages the employees. That's where the secret sauce was. They had them sure. so engaged in how they were supporting them, developing them and rewarding them along the path. And so a very rigorous interview process that they went through for uh, a representative who was, who was in essence on the telephone or using the web to help people purchase shoes. And, but the, the, the program, the, the program was more about cultural fit as opposed to a set of skills. They really had to have a certain mindset. And part of that was being curious. They really wanted the curiosity embedded in that person. They would reward the employees as they completed training through small incremental uh, raises and then to different promotional levels, uh, while at the same time providing a, a ridiculously generous benefit set mm. uh, on, on, the, on the whole while they were on site in the building. And so we can get way deeper into that if you'd like, but the, the, I think the key takeaway there was the engagement of those employees went so high through the roof and they, they did so by encouraging learning having them continually grow in their, in their skill sets to learn more and more about the organization and the industry so that those two points on your slide related to desire to learn new skills and, and a desire for more training, those were never in play because they sure. constantly offered it to the team members. It's so interesting. And I want to go into more of specifying, you know, these skills that we're talking about. If you were to name a couple, a handful, you know, what are these key skills that staff should possess and, more importantly, how can we ensure that they are adequately trained, you know, in these areas? Well, I think one of the things that I saw with Zappos and one of the things that, that we continually train is <laughs> that whole ability to put yourself in the customer's shoes, a mm -hmm. very deep level of customer centricity and understanding how they're seeing the experience that I'm seeing, but from their side of the counter, the table. Uh, the interaction within the doctor's office or from the other side of the telephone, if you can picture that. And so that there, there's a degree of empathy. There's a, a degree of finding a way to communicate with them such that you understand the need they have rather than just pouring out a solution, uh, seeking to understand by asking questions. Here we go with curiosity, right? You're, you're wanting to learn and understand a little bit that you can about that customer in a 30 second to minute long conversation, if that in some instances, but there's still room to ask a question or two to understand. So it's that empathy and understanding what the customer is really seeking as a starting point. The next thing is to truly understand what you can provide them. So you need to understand your business, what products you have and how you can help them. I think one great example that I saw or heard about, I actually didn't see this happening, but I did hear about it as a story was there was one representative at Zappos that spent almost eight hours, an entire day on the phone with one person trying to find a particular pair of shoes that they were adamant that they had seen and wanted. And they searched and searched and, and had callbacks. And it, it was a monster, a, a, a crazy over the top, almost hyperbolic example yeah. of customer support and customer focus where they had no concern whatsoever over any metrics they were given, any expectations that you've got to get through so many calls today, or you can't spend this much longer or you can't send them to another company out there if you don't have it. They were dogged in their efforts to find a solution for this customer. And that is probably an extreme example, but I think it's one that shows the depth to which some people will go in that ability to learn about the customer and to meet them where they are. And I think those are two of the really important skills that continuously learning mindset, mm -hmm. curiosity, and being very customer sympathetic or customer empathetic. I think that points really well to this next slide that we have on some of the most sought after in demand skills that we're seeing. And you talked a lot about the idea of curiosity that want to consistently, consistently learn. 
And I think we're seeing that, you know, especially in people management, I think a lot of that communication, that concept of dealing with other people and other people's, you know, uh, personness, I guess you could say, sure. is definitely highlighted here. And I want to ask you, you know, are these the emerging skills that you're seeing that hourly staff are looking for more or less? You know, I, I think they are. Uh, I, I would. I The order to me doesn't make as much. Uh, it, it doesn't in, uh, sway me when I see the list. I think they're all critical to developing a workforce, period. Mm. Uh, I think as I as I go through these, it, it makes sense that people would want these because most people want to have that leadership. They want to have, I want to be in charge. I want to be the boss. I want to be the one making decisions and directing people for whatever motivation they have. There's just a lot of reasons why people want to do that. So those at the top make sense, mm -hmm. but I would actually argue that the ones that are closer to the bottom or the middle, mainly that, that organizational skill, communication, problem solving, critical thinking, those to me are the ones that are the game changers in right. individual contributors that then make them better and broader, more holistic resources and assets to the organization. I'm thinking about an organization that we just received a, 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 a call from that wanted a critical thinking workshop created for a series of marketers. Um, so now these are, 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 I'll call them frontline workers in that they engage business units um, and, and other individual contributors on strategies around a certain set of products. They don't have people that report to them. Uh, so they're individual contributors and they are all struggling with this ability to think critically. And so as I dug into it, having the, the desire and honestly, the humility to say, I don't really know it all about the market that I'm studying. I need to learn more. That humility drives the curiosity piece. And that's where you can start feeding into that critical thinking uh, and problem solving because you're now equipping that thought process with more data mm -hmm. and more information. So the, the hallmark skill we're going to include in this workshop is being curious and learning and building deeper knowledge about the business you're, you're, you're supporting so that when you bring a solution to the table, you have support and data behind why it would work. Same kind of thing here. As you're thinking through critical thinking and problem solving, when you have a customer that maybe isn't the happiest of customers, having the ability to think quickly, come up with different solutions, be able to communicate that to them with empathy while keeping your cool, it is wildly effective and way more uh, endearing to that customer than it is to uh, either ignore them or to pass the buck to someone else. I just had this experience over the weekend yeah. uh, with, with my father-in-law that uh, had, had had a challenge with, with a big box company supposed to be delivering something to them. Uh, and they got the buck passed around three different times and have wasted four days waiting oh on the clients to be delivered. And uh, in hearing some of the conversations with the people on the other side of the phone, it was very frustrating. Like, gosh, we should train this company because yeah. they're not getting it. They're not listening to this gentleman who has, is frustrated to all get out. So I look at this list and I think, is people management important? Well, to that store manager that hasn't responded yet, for sure. Leadership, organizational skills, communication, problem solving, critical thinking, all of those are part of this job uh, of dispatch, of customer service, of store management. And honestly, to a person, they have failed because the appliance is still not yet delivered right. uh, as of today. And so, again, all these, I think, are very important, Meredith. None of them could would trump another in my mind in terms of being more important than the other. I think it's really up, up to the manager to meet that employee where they are and understand what are their goals and how can I best support you to get there, knowing that these skills are all going to be important as you want to rise to higher levels in the organization. Sure. Would you say that they that these skills range from industry to industry for the most part or across the board pretty fine and even? I, I'd be hard pressed to find anyone that could tell me why these aren't important in almost any organization yeah. to some degree in almost every kind of job. Right. Again, are some going to be more important in certain moments for sure. sure. And, and so I think about that, that person behind the counter at a restaurant taking an order or a person at a, at a store checking someone out at a cash register. Are there moments where they're, they're going to need the ability to problem solve every single No, not at all. 
but there may be a situation with a return and a lost receipt. How do I support this customer while adhering to policy? Or how do I request an, an exception to a policy that the store has set that I've been trained on? And I know when a policy uh, uh, exception has been uh, brought to my attention, what do I do with that? So that's critical thinking. Uh, that's the ability to communicate, not just with the customer, but with leadership in the organization. That Honestly, when I when I was telling you about that critical thinking workshop we were were developing for a company, the second half of that was how do I best engage my internal partners, the other people in my company? Not that has right. to do with the customer. It's how do I engage my leadership team and the other people that are relying on me to do my job? That's where the confidence wasn't coming through and where the communication is also lacking. So. Again, I think it varies from organization to organization, industry to industry, role to role. I think they're all important, but they're going to toggle in and out based on the circumstances. It perfectly segues me into my next question. You know, what is the correlation between customer satisfaction and skill development? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I think they go absolutely hand in hand. Right. <laughs> uh, I, there's no question about that. I, I, again, I'd be hard pressed to find someone that would argue that. I think the now, is, is it, does that mean then that we all we should do is just develop skills in everyone that works for us and they'll be, no, that's right. not what I'm saying at all. It's, it's a bit like the curiosity argument. You know, you people that I, that I train will say, well, so Michael, if all I should, if all I'm you know, asked to do then is just to research and learn all I can about this market or this customer or this type of business, then I could just never leave my office and I'd be great. Well, no, <laughs> because your job is to go and engage your customers. Mm -hmm. that's the job. We're helping you get more effective in those interactions when you're in the job. And so the argument that the better experiences with customers come from development, for sure. But there's a, there's a balance that has to be struck in that as well. I think Zappos is a great example of that, where they invested in the training for those, those call center representatives, but those call center representatives had shifts of call taking that they had to achieve. Um, in order to be permitted then to engage in some of the development training that was afforded them. So the customer experience, I think, is wildly driven by those, um, those, those frontline employees and the better developed they are, I think overall the better experience that customer is going to have. I just read an interesting article in Harvard Business Review related to overall customer experience is greatly enhanced by interaction with all employee types, mm -hmm. not just those on the front line or those that are charged with that interaction, but with anyone at that organization that has the ability to share what that company is about and to seek to understand the needs that that customer has. So there's an argument that says not just those on the front line, but everyone should have customer interaction. So I think that speaks also to that customer experience gaining by development, because I think that development uh, can come from different places and through different employees. It's interesting. You know, I, I sent out a poll question um, a couple of minutes ago. I asked, what are the most sought after or in demand skills in your industry? Some people said multitasking, quick, quick to learn, time management and problem solving, product knowledge and communication. It's a big one. People showing up for work on time and finally soft skills. My question for you, Michael, is what are the most effective training methods for developing these skills and how can we incorporate them in our existing training programs if they're already in there? Wow. So I think there are a couple of ways to answer that, Meredith. I'm going to start with how we address the, the, the challenges that are therein related to organizational skills, time management skills. To me, there, there's, a, there's a mindset you know, that's another big word that we like to go forward with that we embed in a lot of our training. Uh, so this whole idea of being curious is one of them I mentioned a bit ago. You're all probably sick of hearing me talk about that by now. Uh, here will be, this will be the next one you'll probably get tired of hearing about. And that's mindset. You know, mindset is one of those words where I have a, a perception of my reality that's driven by what I see and experience, but it also feeds my ability to engage and to, to find enjoyment in what I'm doing. It's not just necessarily in the task itself, but it's in the mindset I have about that task. And so the trick is, how do I get my mindset to be one that says, I'm going to lean into this. I'm going to take action. I'm going to move. I'm going to hit my numbers. I'm going to be there on time. I'm going to own up to my responsibilities. And we call mm -hmm. this having an action bias or a bias for action. 
Uh, you may have heard of, of a guy named John Maxwell. He's written a ton on this on this subject. I can't even come close to knowing everything he's forgotten on these on these topics. But he he talks about why people aren't leaning in more so in meeting their agenda, getting on getting to places on time. And this this can be with literally any level of employee and for in any kind of job. To me, it's a mindset that I own this and it's up to me to deliver on this or there will be consequences of some sort. Now, that's where the differences could come into be. Like, what are the consequences you're talking about? I'm like, well, you could. I had a young man that worked for me many a year ago uh, in a customer service role and he could not show up on time. And the, I personally am not one of those that endorses a set workday. That's not my mindset. Uh, based on the teams that I've had and the work that we do, there's a chance to be flexible on the front end and the back end of the day, but there are job responsibilities that need to be accomplished. I had that same mindset way, way back in this previous organization. The problem was no one else in the organization or specifically the other team members of mine felt the same way. Mm -hmm. And so the culture of the entire team, that was, this was a smaller team, I think there were eight total, the culture and the engagement of everybody else went down the toilet when they continually saw this person come in late, show up tardy, not be able to get there on time. And so in talking with some people, I actually started getting a couple of people come into me and say, you know, this is not setting a good precedent and it's really kind of starting to deteriorate morale. And they tell me more about that. What is the what is the concern? And they shared it with me. And so at that point, the conversation had to be, here's what's going on. So I engaged HR. We pulled out the job description, explained exactly what we're going to do, documented the, 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 the gaps, and then basically put in a program uh, to monitor. And here are the consequences if, in fact, you can't do this. Uh, and ultimately, he couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and thus, we separated. So really difficult uh, set of circumstances to go through, but at the same time, it's a hard call for a manager to make, but it's one that is best for the team without question. Uh, and so to me, that's the, the part that's the more challenging part on the backside of, of the mindset discussion we were talking about. How, how do I get this person to take on the mindset? So it's either, is there a reward that I can give them or is there uh, uh, some kind of a consequence on the backside that I have to hold out there. And in that case, we held out the consequence. Uh, it didn't have the effect to engage him, uh, but there was, I think, underlying issues and possibly some maturity issues going on at the time. So all that being said, uh, I think it's up to the organization to, to define what the culture is and what's best for that organization in terms of how you either incentivize or, or consequence uh, that mindset. But to me, it's really a mindset. And I think going back to how do I retain? How do I engage? How do I get them to want to do this? Right. Starts with some of the things we talked about earlier on. I think that aspect of mindset and feeling like you're really a part of something points really well to this slide that we have here. Um, another graph, lo and behold, um, <laughs> for Pfizer, on top reasons employees feel adequately skilled. And I think obviously that 51% we're drawn to. I receive personalized one on one skills training from my company. You know, people who, receive this kind of training really feel that sense of loyalty and it really feeds into that mindset and that loop, that cycle that we're kind of alluding to here. My question for you, Michael, is how can frontline managers uh, ensure that they're adequately trained in these areas? And, you know, more importantly, what can HR do to help? So let me just clarify, make sure I understand. So the question relates to ensuring that the frontline managers are equipped in the same skill sets. Is that where you're going with this one? Yeah, and even okay. further than that, on t on more or less on top of it, training uh, their employees, their uh, frontline staff from their managers, and making sure that those skills are transferring over. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think one of the things that I I I, ins I don't insist on it because I'm not the leader of those organizations, so I can't make them do this. But one of the things that I really encourage an organization to do is to have the, the, the frontline leaders that are, are uh, over the teams we're training mm -hmm. attend the very same session. Oh, I, I want that. them to be embedded in the same skill. Yeah. The next level. So, so it's that um, see one, do one, teach one mm -hmm. mindset. 
I want them to go through the course initially. So they're a participant and they hear it from the learner standpoint. What is the learner engaging in? What's the pre-work that they have to complete? What are the activities and the skills they're gaining during the session? And then what's on the backside that they've got in terms of follow-up, sustainment, homework, whatever else there may be. Yep. I then want to teach that manager how to teach it. So they would then be the ones going through a train the trainer, so to speak. I'm going to teach you what's in my head when I'm teaching this and how I relate this, a story I use, an example that I'm pulling from to make this come to life. Then I'm actually going to have them go and teach a class. Then and only then are they, in my mind, truly equipped to take on the ability to diagnose, so observe and diagnose and then correct right. a skill set deficit in someone or to coach them most effectively. We've done it in a whole host of ways, though, Meredith, in terms of either having them, the, learn, the leaders go through the same thing, like I just described, a see one, do one, teach one. I've had them go through a train the trainer where here's what we're going to teach and here's why we're going to teach it. So we kind of give them behind the curtain of the course and explain it to them. So they have the, oh, okay, I see how the dots all connect. And I don't necessarily make them go through the whole course, but I explain to them what we're going to do and have them participate either as table leaders or in the room as, as wandering coaches to help pull it through and make it land in the session. Um, and then the, the uh, another way is, uh, again, just to have them go through as the learner would go through it. And then I coach them one-on-one -on, -one, uh, on the backside where that we're doing a discussion from leader to, to me. Uh, and then there you go in and, and coach their own teams on the backside. So a few different ways to do it. Depends on okay. the capacity of the organization, um, how, the, how the leaders like to learn themselves. But the point is, is that they need to be equipped, in my mind, to the same extent the, the first line employee is. Before we go into tracking, you know, how to track the progress of these programs, how to track the progress of mm -hmm. skill development in general, I'm curious what the ROI is of investing in staff training and development. You know, I, I know there are numbers out there, Meredith. I have, mm -hmm. That's not anything that we've done. There's a part of it that is, uh, in my industry, it gets really icky when you start aligning ROI on anything um, that is a development uh, skill. Um, or development program and just because it, it's, it gets into industry policy and the things that are way, way deep into the pool stuff that we don't have time to get into here, nor is it germane. Sure. So, so I don't have a lot of, of pertinent data. What I, what I go by though is anecdotal okay. and just seeing and hearing from organizations that we've been training now for a number of years. I had a, had a call just the other day with a vice president from an organization. We, we did a couple of workshops with a, a very small team of, of frontline salespeople with him um, last summer uh, to build the curriculum that we put together. I interviewed all of the attendees one-on-one -on -one, spent as little as 45 minutes upward of an hour and a half with each of these individuals to say, okay, tell me what you're really good at. So people come to you to say, Hey, John, Hey, Meredith, Hey, Michael, you're awesome at this. Can you help me get better at that and tell me how you've learned to do this over the years? And then, as I said, so tell me a couple things like that where you're really proud of your skill here. And then maybe tell me one or two things where you're not so good, yep. if you're willing to admit it. Or I haven't had to do that in a while. I want to knock the rust off. Or I just want to learn more about this. I think it's cool. And I, it's not something I ever have to really deploy, but I'd love to learn more. So I sought their input to build tailored programming for them. And as I hear how that landed in a, a session we did in June and then a follow-up session in August, uh, we're engaging them in yet another workshop that we'll deliver uh, later in May. The, the anecdotes from that leader to say, you would not believe the change in approach, in mindset, in confidence, in research and curiosity and how they're managing their stakeholders, both the customer themselves and the internal colleagues at our organization. It's amazing, Michael, what has happened with these people who were 15 to 30 year industry veterans. So these weren't newbies. These were people that had been around for a while, right. but they were looking to upskill them. And so they, A, had the willingness to be curious and learn, and B, were willing to have a mindset of deploying what they just learned. 
in real world cir uh, circumstances. And so I think those anecdotes alone tell me that the development in those people is wildly worth it mm -hmm. because it's going to make that customer experience and ultimately, I think, revenue, ROI, market share, profit, whatever measure your organization may have, customer retention, referrals, pick one, those are going to grow. Because that experience of that customer is going to trigger them to say, wow, that was awesome in working with that company. You need to right. go there. Uh, had such a great experience. Now, think about the story I was telling with my, my father-in-law a little bit ago when he's now dealing with day five of this new washing machine that had to showed up. And what he's going to do. He's already threatening to cancel the order and go somewhere else. Well, yeah. that's kind of an icky outcome, honestly. And none of them, that anything that any of us would want to deal with. So to me, I don't have a good number for you, Meredith, as a takeaway, but I have a ton of anecdotes that show that it's absolutely worth it on every level. Yeah. And I think you touched on the fact that a lot of it falls in line. You know, once you start implementing these programs, once you start training your employees, you're going to see that lower turnover rate. You're going to see that lower costs and labor costs themselves, operating costs it's all such a snowball effect where everything kind of falls on top of each other. And I think truly the baseline of this, we've done so many of these webinars. I always feel like the training is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can train your employees and have a sense of loyalty, engagement will go up, turnover will go down, burnout will decrease a, a whole slew of topics that we can't, we can't get in now because it would just right. take up the next, the next day and a half. But right. I do think that it, it's so, so crucial. And, you know, we might not have a hard number on it, but you would definitely see those labor cost numbers going down, ROI increasing, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go into more on the tracking of skills development. Uh, what are the best methods for tracking these skills of hourly staff? I, I think it depends on the, the degree of, of infrastructure that any organization might have. So, you know, to me, it could be something as simple as a, a spreadsheet, mm. um, just putting the, the list of the, of the employees uh, in, in whatever appropriate manner there is from a privacy standpoint, because we all have those kinds of laws as well. We need to navigate, uh, but then to, to maintain a, a, a record of what they've accomplished uh, all the way up to including, you know, multi-million dollar installed learning management systems where they go online, they access a course electronically, digitally, they complete it, they get an acknowledgement that, yep, I'm done with it. They passed a test, whatever it may be. Uh, and that goes into their permanent employee record to show what training they've accomplished and, and everywhere in the middle of those as well. So a lot of HR systems will have that ability to do uh, training tracking. But I think something as simple as just a spreadsheet at that manager level could be just as simple and just as easy to track. You, know, you could get an error or a date when it was done. or it, it, the, the more human involvement there is, there can be uh, errors made. But I think on the whole, tracking it in any way, shape, or form is better than not, uh, honestly. And I think an employee could... Could track it themselves and have, have that in a uh, during a, a quarterly sit down with their boss or a biannual sit down with their boss. I know we were we've always been big on twice a year having mm. performance development sessions where, hey, uh, let's let's see how your year is tracking and what all of you accomplished thus far, and and part of that was what training have you completed? Right. What all have you done to self develop? Because uh, I don't think I'm not I'm not one of those persons that that endorses the manager being the be all end all when it comes to mandating and directing training. I think it's on the employee uh, to go seek it out as well, uh, to go find that time and say, Hey, I'd like to be able to learn a little bit more. What, what should you, what would you recommend? Or, Hey, I found this. That's even better, mm. but I'd love to review a course. I'd like to take a class. I'd like to sit through a webinar. I'd like to watch a podcast. I'd like to listen to, can I do that? And then maybe we have a chat about it, you know, at a break sometime or, before or after a shift, because I really want to hear what you think about this that I'm learning. I think at some point in, in whatever way that the system affords the organization to track, though, it, it really should be tracked. That's my opinion. What are some KPIs that might be worth tracking to help measure the success of these training uh, programs or these training efforts? Well, from a guy that sells training assets, mm -hmm. I would love a completion report. Right. I'm just sure. Shows, hey, <laughs> we bought this podcast from you, Michael, and, and 
here's our report of how many people listen to it. And when I hear, oh, we had, you know, 10 out of the 40,000 employees at our company listen to your podcast, I kind of get discouraged. Like, oh, yeah. that isn't very uh, uplifting when it comes to the stickiness of what we're producing. Uh, but I think a KPI from a completion standpoint, um, I think a anything that can show um, incremental progress around a skill. And so by that, I mean, is there a, a an assessment? I hate that word because it just sounds so icky and, and scary. Right. But a way to, to, to check to see that a skill has been improved upon across that set of teams. So is there a amount of time it takes that is lesser than it was before the training? Is there... A, a survey that can be done, a customer satisfaction, a card that they turn in, uh, an online survey, a Google rating, anything like that that can show that that it's been it's the, the skill that is aligned to that review has improved mm. um, from the 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 way that the staff engages the customers. That number, that that yellow tr- uh, star on the rating, went from a three to a four, or from a four to a five. So the organization I used to work for and that we do a lot of work with now um, had a, a way of assessing that. It was the it was a third party research organization that assessed uh, manufacturers in the pharma world with different types of customers that they worked with. And they went out to those customers and said, in essence, at the end of the day, it was a series of, I think, four different categories with four or five questions in each one. So it was up to 20 questions or so. And at the end of that survey, it was, with which company do you prefer to do business? That was the big takeaway. And the company I worked for at the time was dead last out of their peer group in that rating in a certain set of customer types. And we were presented that data and said, that will be fixed. And after we worked with our uh, leadership team and the team of the business unit, uh, some marketers and whatnot, we engaged a, a training program that aligned specifically to the feedback we got in that survey that said, yeah. all you do is talk about your product. You don't ever talk about me and what I've got going on. Yeah. All you care about is getting you, your your agenda hit when we meet. I never, you never ask me what I want to talk about. You don't know anything about my business. You only know about your business. You don't have a clue as to what we really do. All those kinds of feedback things, we completely turned around to the point where there were two different teams involved. One went to number one in that grouping and one went to number two in that grouping Hmm. of their peers after a two-year investment. And that's an exceedingly high KPI to hit because it was a big, long-range, long-term. Not a great example for everybody sitting here today, but one that I think was tailored specifically to the gap we saw. So to me... The KPI needs to be against the measures you're being judged against by your customers. Find out what they care about and apply a KPI that matches to that. So let's say fast forward, we've got skills development properly tracked. How can managers address areas of weakness when they see it? Well, I think part of that is is really understanding what is the weakness, right? So we think about the the a measure of skill or, or an assessment, I look at it through two different sets of lenses. Is it a will or is it a skill? Skills oh, can I be retrained, right? So you can teach that skill. So let's, let's use something. Uh, they're, they're a, a set of staff members are, are really struggling with the, the, the checkout system mm-hmm. uh, that the, that the, 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 uh, the retailer or the, the place of business has. And it takes time. It's slow. People complain about it. Is it a skill? They don't understand how the technology works with, you know, the way technology has evolved, unless they're just not very good at using a Roku device or an iPhone. They're probably more in the, I don't really want to, as opposed to, I don't know how to, right? I think about my old school hi-fi system that I bought. That's an old turntable and an old amplifier. Uh, that I love because it's pure two-channel stereo and I can play Mm -hmm. my vinyl records on it. I haven't yet trained any of my girls how to use it. So it's not necessarily a lack of will on their part. They really want to learn how to use it. Sure. 
they just don't have the skill and I'm scared to death to let them go play with it because <laughs> they might tear it up. Right. Of course. And crash this, this new old system that I invested in. Right. <laughs> so, so to me finding out just on a report that says, Hey, we fast forward, here's what it says. Okay. Is it a will issue or a skill? And if it's a skill, those can be retrained. You can find out, okay, did, was it only presented in a certain format? And thus mm -hmm. we need to bring in different ways that people can learn. Do we need some experiential learning versus just a didactic? Do we need group discussions and peer learning? Or do we need it to be one-on-one -on -one coaching? All those things can be deployed against the skill. The will is a whole nother thing. We talk a lot about that early on, Meredith, with that curiosity and that mindset. So what is it? Is it boring? Is it uh, that you're easily distracted? You can't focus? Um, is it you just don't enjoy it? It's You don't, you don't have any passion behind it. You don't see how it fits in the big scheme of things and you just feel like you're wasting your time you know what is it somewhere there's a will or a skill and that to me is the root that you got to find out as to why there's a gap i love it somehow there's a will or a skill that's so awesome i want to quickly uh sum it up before we get in the q a on asking you what are one or two top tips actions or takeaways our audience could leave with to better track skills of hourly workforce i think getting the the frontline leaders really heavily involved and invested is probably my single biggest takeaway. And we talked a little bit about investing in them, not only as, as leaders um, from a learning standpoint, but helping them understand exactly what the learners are going through so they can better coach it. They can observe what's happening. They can diagnose the challenge or issue, and they can then deploy a resource to that. Be it, it may be themselves. They're the resource. Mm -hmm. Or it may be the trainer. You may be a guy like me that comes in that you've hired outside that can come in and do some retraining. Um, it may be the will issue that you've uncovered. But to me, that the investment in that frontline manager is, is the essence here. I think the other piece is to ask, what is it you want to do? How do you want to grow? What would you like to learn when it's afforded that, when they're afforded that opportunity and not mm -hmm. just say, here's the next thing. You know, we talk about, um, the peanut butter approach where we get a big glob of peanut butter and we spread it out across that whole piece of bread. That's how we have traditionally done learning in large group settings uh, with our, with our training uh, for, for companies when they say, Hey, we run our want, we want to run a workshop. What do you have? Yeah. And I say, well, um, rather than that, why don't, let's talk about what you need. And then how does that filter out across the organization so that we can tailor it best to the, broadest swath of the organization while we can then tailor some unique experiences within for those that have unique needs and desires. So we don't do the peanut butter approach. We build something tailored by asking questions and understanding. So I think the simplest way there is with an employee, what have you learned so far that you'd like to continue growing in? And what's one thing you haven't learned yet that you'd like to? And have that manager be the one that facilitates that dialogue. Yeah, I love that. That is such a great point. I want to quickly go into our Q&A with the last five, 10 minutes or so. Uh, we did have a couple emailed in questions, so we'll get to those. If you guys have any questions, throw them in the chat box. I'll be sure to prioritize those live questions first. Uh, first and foremost, we have a question from Tegan. Uh, they said, we've been receiving a lot of feedback from our staff about wanting to improve upon skills that aren't necessarily relevant for our business. How do I focus their attention on skills that are worth developing? Well, so great. Hey, Tegan, that's a great question. If you're on the, the webinar with us, I, thank you for that. First of all, uh, an excellent question. So to me, it, it's, I'd want to understand if I'm you, what are the skills that they're looking to grow in and how is it that the employees see them as being germane, pertinent, relevant to the role, just so I can see how they're thinking through those asks, right? Because while we may see a certain set of skills that they need to learn, uh, and I think that may be where you're going, that look, they, they got to do these. Right. They're talking about doing these over here. Mm -hmm. I'd want to say, okay, how do you see those fitting into making you better at the job at hand? And, and have a dialogue around that, not a, you know, not sit there and have a 45 minute conversation just about that. But I think a few minutes to spend on, tell me why these are important to you. And then let me share with you why these are important to being successful in the job. Because once that's achieved, we likely can then start talking about things that are maybe over here to the margin a little bit 
that will help you grow holistically uh, as, as an employee and potentially as a leader. Yeah. Uh, but I'd, I'd want to understand the mindset that they're seeking of where they're coming from with those skills that appear to be kind of on the, on the fringes or outside of the center of the pitch right. as they use in soccer. Um, I'm a big Ted Lasso fan, so I use those, <laughs> those phrases in there. So think of down the center of the pitch versus along the sides. They're bringing up stuff that's along the sides. Right. Uh, and you want them to stay in the center. Get it. They got to do that. I'm kind of the same way, right? Look, there are certain things you just have to understand yeah. and be able to do in your job. We're going to wave in some of the other cool stuff later. Uh, like in my industry, they, they have to, have to, have to know the product. They cannot not know the product because there are regulations and promotional guidelines that right. if they don't, they're in trouble and their organization's in trouble. There are fun things they want to do. And the one they always say, I want to be a great negotiator. I just love to, I want to be able to negotiate. They have this mindset that somehow negotiation is this crazy big picture, you know, interesting strategic thing. And that's all they want to do. They talk about that all the time. Instead of nine times out of 10, they can solve the problem without ever negotiating. If they just learn to sell better. And they, part of that is they need to understand their product better. Same kind of thing here. They're wanting to go to the fringes. Like what's important to you there? Well, I really want to, okay. When I uncover is they really want to engage better and be more confident that stems from knowing the product. Mm -hmm. So to me, those core skills are driving, are going to drive a confidence level that's going to make them that better engaging the customer, which then in turns customer engagement, loyalty by the customer, better reviews, better ratings, more referrals. And they're going to be happier at their job because they get a lot of smiley faces on their reviews and their uh, online uh, feedback, which I think is really important to them or should yeah. be. That's for sure important. That's awesome. Elise M asked, I work for a restaurant chain as a general manager. I feel that skill development is too vague to trust as each manager, mid manager seems to have their own thoughts mm. on each employee's progress. How can I mitigate this? Wow. <clears throat> you just hit on um, <laughs> a wildly challenging question to resolve. Mm -hmm. um, we had an experience with an organization where we were, trying to teach the frontline managers how to review a basically a plan that their sales teams had put together for their territory. And they were all different. And each manager, as we engage them, we were saying, well, tell me how you interpret this part. The eight people were different almost every single time we asked right. them to describe what is it you're looking for? What makes a good part B or section two or whatever this is, right? Sure. They were all over the map. And so that d diversity of thought and differences in viewpoint of what good looks like or what makes for development, where are they? Uber subjective across the board. It doesn't matter the industry in my opinion. So in, in the case you're describing though, um, Elise, right? Uh, I think was the one that wrote that in. Mm -hmm. The, to me, it's, it's grounding the managers on here's what good looks like. Here's what the expectation is that we as an organization have. And let's at least establish somewhat of a baseline so that everybody's thinking through it at the same level. That may be really challenging uh, with a, a, a set of diverse locations across a geography. It, it could even be di wildly different from even just within a single town. Mm -hmm. If you have multiple sites in a single town, but to me, somehow finding a way to standardize that. And it may be just on, on a couple of points. Just start simple and get a couple of things grounded so that everyone can agree this is what good looks like in this particular situation from a development standpoint. And if they're below it, you need to deploy these things. And if they're exceeding it, here's what that looks like in terms of their delivery of the, the job skills. So that I don't know if that helps or not, at least. Yeah. But to me, that would be a starting point to get some level of baselining. And then as you get a couple skills set up or a couple areas of development baseline, then you can move around and, and hit a couple more. Totally. And getting everyone on the same page. Like, I, I think that's exactly uh, such a good point. Truly. Uh, I don't want to keep anyone over the hour. So we're going to stop those questions there. I know we had a couple more. I'm sorry if we didn't get to them. But quickly, I just wanted to thank you, Michael, for coming on and sharing some amazing, amazing insight. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience did too.